We will start again. Anyone who's new, who was not here yesterday, who had just arrived for this meeting? Nice, welcome. Just an update, we, we had a, a really good meeting yesterday. A lot of things happened. We were talking about discipleship, how to uh, heal the sick. We were talking about Luke chapter 10. And yesterday I talked a little about walking and the things God had prepared for us to walk in. Was a good day yesterday? Yeah. Today we are going to continue and we are going to uh, look at uh, the gospel first and then I'm going to share the gospel with you afterwards and then we are going to have baptism this afternoon at two o'clock down in, in the back here there is a big sea, we're going to have baptism there and then after baptism there will still be poss possibility to go with teams out on the street And then we will meet tonight where I'm going to continue a little what I talked about yesterday. So I hope you're ready. For you who have already been on those kickstarts before, um, the first lesson here, the first lesson here I'm going to talk about the gospel. Um, but I, I will do a little different this time, I think. Well, I am. Because just five minutes ago on the way here I, I got an idea. So, so I have not like I was like, I was going reading the Bible on the way here because like that that is really interesting. So, so I will try to take a different angle on it, and and I hope uh, it will really be a blessing for many of you. Um, so, I hope you're ready. So, I will just pray. God, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you because you are teaching us. Pray that you come with your Spirit today and set us free from. Every wrong idea we have got when it comes to salvation, when it comes to the kingdom, when it comes to what you brought us. Come with your Holy Spirit. Help me to share this word in the name of Jesus. Amen. Very short, I will I would like you to do this. Everyone do this. And uh If you, we are used to doing this without thinking a lot of what we are doing. Can, can you come up and can you come up? And I, want you to, I just want to illustrate something before I start. Can you stand there? And you stand there and just do like this. And everyone, keep your hands like this. You're not allowed to move your hands before I say, now you can move it. And if I see you move your hand before time, I'm going to point you out and you're going to be ashamed in front of everyone else. <laughs> If I look at the hands here, no, sorry, I actually need another person. You can sit down. You can sit down. You can sit down. I need, I need, no, you just stand there. Just stand there. Do like this. I'm just looking at your hand. I need, I need you. Can you stand there? Okay, do you like, stand there. There, 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 there. Do like this. Okay, if I look now at their hands, he have his right thumb in the top. She have the left thumb in the top. How many have the right thumb in the top like him? Up with your hand and down. How many have the left thumb in the top? Up with your hand, down. <laughs> This is almost half of half. Half of you is doing it like her. Half of you is doing like him. Half of you is doing the right way and half is doing the wrong way. No, there is no right and wrong way. Why do we do it like this? Because many years ago when we... Hey, 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 you are moving your hands already. Look at us. No, that's fine. Uh, I forgive you. What we are used to doing, we have always kept doing. So when you are a child and your parents said, do like this, or you did like this, you do like this, and you continue doing like this. When you are a child, you did like this, and you continue doing like this. And it seems so natural for us because this is what we are used to. When I count to three, everyone is going to move their fingers, not only the top finger, but move all the fingers. And then you are going to feel how it is when your neighbor is doing like that. Are you ready? One, two, three, now. Move all the fingers. How is that? Do you like it? Strange. Do you like it? No, then do like this. Just and sit down again. What I want to illustrate here is that suddenly we are... Let's say the power of tradition. 
we are used to doing it one way and we think that that is the only natural way because it feels right. Because we don't know anything else. Not knowing that there is another way to do it. If we from one second is going to move, change from one second to another, ah, it feels weird. Because we are used to something else. It's okay. This is not important if you do it the right way like I do. Or the wrong way like some of you do. <laughs> that is not, that, this is not important how you do it. But it's important how you understand the gospel. And I would just say that the problem with being deceived is that you don't know you are deceived. That is the problem, being deceived. That is the whole thing of being deceived. You are not aware you are deceived. And we grow up in a church culture where we are used to doing it one way and it feels so natural because this is what we know. This is what we have heard. And we as believers, we are very fast to stand there and say, hey, look at Jehovah's Witness out there. They are wrong. Mormons, they are wrong. Look at Islam. They are wrong. Yes, but what about looking at ourselves at one time? Because the church denomination you got saved into, how you got introduced, if it was Catholic, you think that is the only right way. If it was Lutheran, you think it's the only right way. If it was Pentecostal, if it was baptism, you often think this is the only right way. Why? Because this is what you are used to and what you think everyone else is doing. Most are deceived when it comes to the gospel. Because what we build the gospel on is not what the world is saying, but it's thousand years of traditions. Like how many in this room got baptized as a baby? Look at that. That is tradition. If we go in and look at it, there was no baby baptism in the first many hundred years. But then tradition crept in. First, in tradition, they baptized. Baptized mean immersed. They got immersed. But then at one time in church history, different ideas came in. And one time the idea came in, if you one time sin after you are baptized, you are lost forever. So people now lay out, lay out baptism to the end just before they're going to die. So now, baptism became sick people on the deathbed because they don't want to get baptized too early because if you sin after you're baptized, you are lost. So now it became sick people on the deathbed who was baptized. What did they do then? It's not easy to take a sick person down in water. So a cardinal in the 700s agreed that, okay, baptism now is sprinkling of water on the head but only when you are laying in bed. But a few hundred years, that became the norm. And now, all of us who lift their hands, we got spring of water on the head. Why? Because a cardinal in 752 decided something, and somebody else in 1350 decided something else. And now we got baptized with sprinkling. What about baby baptism? We have a state church religion. It started there. The Catholic Church became a state religion. And you cannot have state religion without every member in that state become a member of that religion. And there is where baby baptism come in. And Martin Luther maybe reformed the Catholic Church, but not back to the Bible. We have the Lutheran Church today. Why do I got baptized as a baby in Lutheran Church? Because in year 300 and something, we have constant sting, and later we got the Catholic Church and many hundred years of tradition, and we end up with the Catholic Church the way it is today, and then we got Martin Luther, who tried to reform the church, who did not reform the church, and then we came to, got the Lutheran Church, and we got the Dutch Reform, Reformation, and all of that, and now we have many hundred people here who lift their hands who got baptized as a baby. With sprinkling of water. It's not Bible, it's not biblical. They did not do it in the early church, in the book of Acts. It's tradition. Another tradition is the whole sinner's prayer. How do you get saved? What is salvation? And I can see a tradition that really crept in. 
And that, this is somehow even newer. That, that had to do in the 60s in America when they start with the big campaigns where meetings became about getting people saved. The gospel, we think today the gospel is about, about getting people saved here and now. Here and now. Like we have one meeting. Okay, I need to be sure that you are saved here and now. And if you do the right thing here and now in this second, congratulations, you are saved. Congratulations, you are born again. And it don't matter so much what happened after because you are saved. This is the lie like the Lutheran church. I got told in the Lutheran church, I got baptized as a baby. I went to heaven no matter how I live. So for me, it was not about how you lived. It was about what you did as a baby. Like that water on the head in a building called church should make a difference in all eternity. We know that is wrong today. I think most people in this room know it's wrong today that you are safe, you are born again, if you are a baby and get water on the head in Luther and Catholic Church. We agree in that. Do we? I think most people see how weird that is. Like, it's weird. I know people in the Lutheran church in Denmark, they would rather have their... I've heard people who rather have their kids go out and take drugs and live as prostitutes. At least they are safe because they got water on the head. The worst thing they can do is get baptized again with immersion because then they cancel the first baptism and then they're lost. That is weird. That is weird. But what about the rest? What about how we are preaching the gospel today? We are preaching the gospel where it's all about salvation. If you do this right now, in this moment, you are guaranteed you are going to heaven forever. And we are preaching the gospel of salvation. I don't see that in the Bible. They are not preaching the gospel of salvation. They are preaching the gospel about following, following Christ. Yes! A fruit of that is, of course, salvation. But they are not so much focused on that first second here and now. They are focused on that road that was leading to something. Jesus is the road that leads to something. It's all about the road. What road? Jesus in Matthew here is saying in Matthew 7, Enter to the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that lead to destruction. And those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that lead to life. And those who find it are few. That is Jesus' words. Jesus is introducing us to two roads. One road that is wide, one road that is easy. And it leads, leads to destruction. And most people will go there. Then there is another road that is narrow. And there is hard that leads to life. And because it's narrow, it's because it's hard, there's only a few who enter there. What, in your mindset, what is the broad road and what is the narrow road in percentages? Let's say it like that. The broad road is that 51% that's following that, and the narrow road that is 49 then it's a little broader, then it's a little, a little narrower. How many percentage will we sit on if we should say how many are following one road and how many is following the other road? In the early church, they did not have the New Testament like we have, but they have the Old Testament. And they were preaching out of the Old Testament. If we look at strong pictures of salvation in the Old Testament, there was the ark. Noah and the ark. There is a picture of the Baptist that now saved us. Peter, chapter 3. How many lived at the time at Noah? We don't know. Some people say millions. Other people actually say billions at the time. The B 
became many hundred years and they got many kids. Let's say there was one billion. How many got saved? Eight. How many percent is that? That is not a lot, is it? Is that a broad road and is that a narrow road or what? Is that a narrow gate? There was only eight who entered into that ark. The rest died. Another picture, Egypt. The Israelite was slave in Egypt. Moses came and set his people free. There was a million who entered out, men, and then a lot of women and a lot of kids. Let's say there was eight million who got saved out of Egypt. Who was going to enter into the kingdom, into the promised land. How many entered out of those two? How broad road is that and how narrow road is that? I'm just, what, what do Jesus said? The son of God, will he find faith when he come back on earth? The thing with being deceived is that we don't know we are deceived. We are like a blind leading a blind. We in our church look around us and we think we do what our neighbor do. And then we think everything is okay. What is that narrow road and what is that broad road? Or narrow road and broad road. There's two roads that lead to something. And if you go in and study Roman, the book of Romans, you can see two roads again and again. There's the road of the flesh and the road of the spirit. There is the righteousness, there is sin. The flesh, the spirit. The flesh, the spirit. And Paul is saying that in Galatians 5, 20, when he talks about the deed of the flesh, and he talks about the fruit of the spirit. And he said, those who work by the deed of the flesh, they are going to die. He says that to believers, people in church. If you walk by the flesh, you are going to die. Because that is the narrow road. And the broad road that leads to destruction. Salvation is more than just do something here and now and go to heaven. Salvation is about enter into the kingdom. But salvation has to do with getting sin out of your life. Jesus was the Lamb of God who was removing us, taking our sin. He got the name Jesus because he should save us from our sins. To be saved from our sins don't mean that we are as church on Sunday and worship God and keep sinning. That is not to be saved from our sins. To be saved from our sins is to be saved from our sins. Salvation has to do with saving us. From our sins. It has to do with making a new creation. It has to do with making some people who obey the law. Not the law of Moses. We're not under that. But the law of Christ. People who walk by the spirit and not by the flesh. Many people have come to faith in Christ. That is not the full picture of salvation. That is the beginning of salvation. Many people have repented. That is not the full picture of salvation. That is the beginning of salvation. Many people even got baptized. That is not the full picture of salvation. That is the beginning of salvation. It's all about becoming a new creation. It's all about walking by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And the picture we see very clear, what road is it that leads to salvation? The Old Testament, we have the Egypt. They were captured. The Israelites were captured in Egypt as slave. This is a picture of you and me today. We were slave to this world. We were in this world. We were bound as slave to sin. And we could not free ourselves because we were slave. Then God sent Moses. There is a picture of Christ. And he came to Pharaoh, to Satan, and said, let my people go. 
and he didn't do it. Then we saw the signs and the wonders. But Satan was fighting. But in the end, the firstborn died. A picture of Jesus. The firstborn died. The death walked through the city. But those people who took the lamb, slaughtered, slaughtered the lamb, and took their blood over the door, death did not enter, death walked by. They got saved that day from death by the blood of Jesus. They got saved that day from Egypt out of this world. And when they came out, millions of people, they were rejoicing. They were celebrating. They were happy. Why? Because they had been slaved and now they are not slaves anymore. So they came out rejoicing and happy. We are free. We are free. We are free. But that is not the full picture of salvation. That was just the beginning of salvation. If they have stopped there and say, now we are saved, they have been lost. Because they were not saved yet. They have yet not entered into the promised land. There was a road they need to walk. So after they got saved out of Egypt, short time after, Pharaoh changed his mind, so he sent his army after the Israelites. And short time after, they were like, Oh no, we are going to die! We are going to die! We are going to die! Because now the army came after them. And they stood there and did not know what to do. So they were saved out of Egypt, but now they needed to get saved one more time. They needed to get saved from Egypt, from that army. How did they get saved again? Through the water. Through the baptism. They went down to the Red Sea and went on the other side. But when they came out of that water, the old life followed them. But the old life got drowned in the water. And they came up on the other side and they rejoiced with music and celebrating and praising God. Hallelujah. Praise God. We are saved. We are saved. Never again we are going to look back at the old life and think, when are they going to come and kill us? Never again we need to fear what happened that. Because it's over, it's out, it's drowned, it's gone. We are now free. We are safe. We are safe from our sins. We are safe from our past. We are safe from everything that kept us captured in so many years. But we still remember that those people who that day celebrated, we are saved, we are saved, we are saved, they got killed. And only a few entered into the promised land. Because after that salvation, they needed to learn to walk by the Spirit. By the cloud and the pillar of light. And what happened there? If you go to, if, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you can read that what happened with them. It's written down in chapter 10. It's written down for us who live today. That we should not do the same as they did. And Paul, he says here, Do you not know? That in a race all is running, but only one received the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a crown that is going to disappear, but we are going to do it for a crown that is never going to disappear. I do not be like a boxer hidden in the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control. 
Lest after preaching to order, I myself shall be disqualified. And then he came with that example of the Israelite. Salvation is near now than we came to faith, the Bible says. We are saved, but we get saved, but it's the one who keep on to the end who shall be saved. When you said yes to Jesus, he put you on a road. It's a narrow road. He's the door. It's not everyone who start that walk who's going to enter into the kingdom. It's everyone who's going to finish that walk who's going to enter into a kingdom. If I should preach to somebody who was going to just take the first step of salvation and die today and go to heaven tomorrow, there is no need of preaching baptism, maybe, or Holy Spirit, or continuing Christ, why they're going to die in a few minutes. I would just say, cry, cry, uh, cry to Jesus, shout to Jesus, repent with everything you have in you. He's the one. He's salvation. You're going to die in two minutes. We hope that they really give everything to him and he received them. But we are not called to just preach, do this and go to heaven. We are called to preach the road. And if you say that it's just enough to believe in God and ask Jesus to your heart, you can make sure that those people are not going to enter into the heaven. Because they will maybe start believing, but they think, that was all. I have it now. And then they will sit down, and short time later, they will fall away. We need to preach a radical gospel. We need to preach a gospel where it it's about entering into the kingdom. And the truth is that in a room like this, there's only a few who are going to do it. It's only a few that's really going to fulfill that race. Because we have heard a wrong gospel. We have heard it so easy. Just believe in Jesus and you are saved. Just get some water on your head as a baby, you are saved. Or just get baptized in a Baptist church and you are saved. How do you know that? It's about walking by the Spirit. It's about killing flesh in your life. It's about living a holy life. It's about living in obedience against the Spirit and not against the flesh. And this is where repentance, baptism, water, Holy Spirit, all of them make sense. Because salvation is about becoming new. It's about repentance. Repentance has to do with sin. Everything has to do with sin. Baptists have to do with sin. The Holy Spirit has to do with sin. It's all about making us holy. It's all about changing our way of living so we don't live like the world. If we live like the world, we are going to die like the world. If we live in flesh, if we walk by the flesh, you are going to die. No matter if you believe in Jesus or not. Are you there? So what is salvation? Salvation is about making us new. Salvation is about making a new creation. Salvation is about getting sin out of us. And helping us to walk by the Spirit. And when we keep in faith... Keep in obedience. We will one day stand there in front of God. And we will enter into the kingdom. Salvation has to do with repentance. It has to do with sin. We don't like to talk about that nowadays. Jesus got the name Jesus because he should save us from our sins. We are actually saved from God's wrath. Because of our sins. Sin is a problem. The Bible says that the one who does sin become a slave to sin. I remember when I was a child, when I got born as a baby, I, I didn't think about what was right and wrong. But then I grow up and I start to recognize good and evil. And then I start to do wrong things. And I start to become a slave to that. 
I wanted to live a different life, but I could not change myself because I was a slave. I wanted to love people. I wanted to do what is right, but I couldn't because I was a slave. I I was a slave to lying. I was a slave to looking with girls in a wrong way. I was a slave to sin. I was a slave to so many things. And I often did things I knew was wrong, but I could not save myself. I needed help. And there Jesus came. And the first step to get out of this world is repentance. It's a new heart. And that is to really recognize what sin is. And actually, it took me some years because I heard about Jesus, I repented, but it was first some years later I really understood how sin is sinful. Because often we compare ourselves with each other and we think, no, I'm not so bad. Look at her, look at them, look at them. But sin is so much worse than we ever imagined. And when you start to look at, I'm going to do that later, if you start to look at the law of God, like, have you murdered somebody? No, I'm not a murderer. Have you killed somebody by having hate in your heart? Have you been unfaithful? No, 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 I've only been with my my wife and maybe one more. But the Bible says that is the law sin, but have you looked with lost on somebody? You already done it in your heart. Have you broken one of the law, you are guilty in them all. The more we look at God's standard, the more we look at what God is saying, the more we will see one thing, we are guilty. We have fallen big times because God is holy and we are not. And we need to recognize sin. We need to understand that it's not our standard that's important, it's God's standard. And we have to come to a place where we really feel sorry for our sins. It's not enough to say, yeah, I feel sorry because I want to go to heaven. Everyone wants to go to heaven. It's really feel sorry because I've sinned against a holy, righteous God and what I'm doing is wrong. God gave me his life to worship him, to honor him, to live for him. And I've taken what is holy and made something unholy out of it. I have misused God. And understand that sin is sin. Sin is wrong. And then come to that point of repentance where you feel sorry for it. You regret it. And you turn away from it. Repentance is not say sorry today and do it tomorrow. It's really feel sorry and then repent. And in that deep, deep repentance and feel sorry... Something is changing inside of you. God is going to change your heart. God is going to make your conscience new again. And I remember we are so used to sin. It, it comes in slowly. I remember before I was a Christian, there was movies I saw all the time. I love it. I love it. I love it. And then I repented. I turned away and I got a new conscience. And then when I put that movie on to see one of my favorite movies, I was used to loving it. I love it. And then I put it on now and suddenly I'm like, I hate it. I hate it. Look, I don't want to see it anymore. I, I fell inside of me. It was wrong. Why? Because suddenly my eyes have been open. I could see now how sinful it was. The same with my music. I was used to listen to music that was really off. That was really demonic. You maybe not call it demonic, but... Oh, what? I don't know. It's just what young people listen to nowadays. And I was used to listening to it. I didn't have a problem, but when I really saw good and evil, when I repented, God gave me a new heart. Then when I put that music on, oh, let's throw the DVDs out. So I had a break DVDs party at home. I broke 200 DVDs. <laughs> Actually, a half year later, I found still DVD pieces in my house <laughs> that show that I don't clean enough. <laughs> Things changed. I stopped thinking like I did before. I start to think different. I stopped walking like I walked before. I started to walk different. I was used to walking by my flesh. 
on the broad road. But now I enter into the narrow road. I start to walk by the Spirit instead. But it was not enough. Some people have repented. Some people come to faith and they think, I'm safe now. No, it's only the beginning of salvation. Because I experienced this that the Israelites experienced. Short time after they came out of Egypt, Pharaoh and his soldiers came after them to take them back to capture, to jail. I experienced that because I experienced the freedom. And I was walking in freedom for some months, a year. But suddenly the old life started to come and take over again. It was like sin came in again. The old thing I before dealt with started to come in again. And I felt like I started to fight and fight and fight more to continue walking by the Spirit, and it was so difficult. And I experienced a battle inside of me, like Paul is describing Romans 7. The good things that I want to do, I do not do, and the bad things I don't want to do, I do, but it's not me, but sin who dwells in me. Romans 7, 14, many people know that verse. In the churches today, it's being said that Romans 7, 40 is the normal Christian life. If you have been taught that, you have been deceived. Paul, he's talking about how it was if you walk by the flesh. Because in Romans 6, he talks about how there's freedom in baptism. Because in baptism, you put off the old man who are bound to sin. You die for the old man. You die with Christ. You rise up with Christ. In baptism, you wash away sin. You experience forgiveness. There is so much freedom in that. And it's not only theology. It's something we should experience. Everything is Bible is experience, something to experience. It's not something we only said in our head. We should experience the freedom. We should experience the salvation. We should experience the Holy Spirit. And I remember I had a time in my life where I was fighting. I was like trying and trying and trying to live a good life. And then I fall back again. It was like something was pulling me back. I was trying, I was trying, I was trying, but then I fall back again. Yeah, I love Jesus. Yes, I spoke in tongues at that time. Yeah, I was a radical guy in church. Yeah, I thought I was saved. I was saved, but it was not the full salvation. I'd be saved out of Egypt, but I needed to get saved from Egypt. I needed more for me to really live that freedom and to continue and to enter into the promised land. So I needed one more salvation. I needed one more thing. I needed to be free from the old life, one time for all. And that was where baptism came in. For me, I have just got baptized, but when I got baptized, nobody really explained me what baptism was. So I could not grab it in faith. You have to understand what it is to grab it in faith. Otherwise, it just become a pool party. But after I got baptized, I came home and I started to study, study, study Romans 6, Romans 7, Romans 8. And in Romans 6, where it's talking about baptism, we read something again and again that you are free from sin. You are not bound to sin. You are not a slave to sin. You are not under the law anymore. You are under grace. You are free. You are not bound. A new life. And I just read it again and again and again. And in the middle of that, suddenly it became clear, this is what baptism is. I'm free. I'm free, but if I'm free, I don't need to walk like that anymore. And when I got that revelation, I stood up and I say, yes, I'm free. And something changed in me. And that day I got saved one more time. I would say that day the new birth really took place it took me six years to be born again it could have happened the same day if we did what the bible have said if we had somebody who could really 
explain what repentance, baptism, water, and Holy Spirit is. But it took me six years. The first six years, I was sure I was safe and everything was. I was safe, but when I experienced that salvation, now I knew. <laughs> I know, okay, now I'm there. But I still know that I'm, not de- I'm there, but I'm not there. Understand? Because it's one thing to start, is something else to finish the race. Now I got a new heart. Now I got set free from sin. And now I got the Holy Spirit. So what do I need to do now? I need to walk the narrow road. I need to learn to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. If I now as a believer who loves Jesus, who believe in God, who read the Bible, choose to go and walk by the Spirit again, I will get lost. Of course I will get lost. I have to continue in Christ. I have to continue abide in Him. I have to continue renewing my mind. I have to continue walking by the Spirit. And remember when I said that, Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are worried and carry heavy burden, and I will give you rest. It's not like, oh, no, now I have to really be strong. And no, just, just die. It's, it's, it's more easy. It's just, just die. Just come to that point like, Jesus, it's just you. Just die. But some of you make it so difficult for yourself because you keep on to the world a little and you have a little world and a little God. A little world and a little God. And then you make it so difficult for you and of course you would fight, 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 fight. Some of you like... Go back to your old friends again and again and again and fall and then go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then next week you go back and fall again. And then you come, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then next week you go back again. You make it so difficult for yourself. And you're going to get lost in the end. Repent. Cut away those friends if it is. Throw that TV out of the house. If that is what you fall in front of every time, just throw it out. Yeah, but you don't understand, I have a workplace, and every time I'm on a workplace, I just feel like life is drawing out of me, and I'm sinning every time I'm doing wrong thing. Okay, then drop your work. No, but, 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 but I need the money. Okay, but what is more important in life? That is your soul. That is the only important thing. And if you look at Paul, he said, I'm hard with my body. I discipline my body. I'm not like a boxer who's standing and fighting like this. I'm taking care of my body. I'm disciplining my body. So me who are preaching to others shall not be disqualified. Why? Because if you are in a race and you get disqualified, you are out of the race. And you're not going to end saying again. We are all in a race. And we are not running to get a prize that's going to visa. We are running to get a eternal prize that's never going to visa. The crown of righteousness. The eternal life. That is a run. That is a road. That is a narrow gate. That is a narrow road. And there's only few who find it. So, you cannot preach, if you preach a gospel without full repentance, if you preach a gospel without baptism, if you preach a gospel without the Holy Spirit, then you have not understood what the kingdom is about. Because you need it all to be able to walk the rock and to enter into the kingdom of God. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God and fulfill the race without those three things. Do you understand? The kingdom is more than just going to heaven. We often say, but Jesus, okay, okay, let's say it like this. 
People say the gospel. What is the gospel? People say, yeah, the gospel is that Jesus died according to the word of God. Word. He got rose up again according to the word, and so on. This is Corinthians, First Corinthians, chapter one. They say the gospel is that Jesus died on the cross. That is correct, but you know Jesus was preaching the gospel even before he died on the cross. And those people who walk with him did not know that Jesus would die on the cross. They have no idea of it. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Yes, when Jesus died on the cross, he got buried, he rose up again. He made a road for us to enter into that. But it's a gospel of the kingdom. We have one king, that is Jesus Christ. He has some laws. Like in every other kingdom, in every kingdom there is laws. And we need to obey the laws of our king. We are not under the law of Moses anymore. But that do not mean we are lawless and can live how we want to live. We are under the law of Christ. It's his word. Now he's our king. We are his servant. And we obey our master, our Lord. And by us obeying our master, our Lord... And live in obedience and faithfulness toward him. One day he will say to us, Good, my faithful servant, you have been faithful in many small things. Enter into my rest. Enter into my kingdom. I look forward to that day. I'm not there yet. So therefore... I need to keep sharp. And if I want people to enter in there together with me, I need to preach a radical gospel. If I just preach an easy gospel, hey, if you believe and have a faith and do this, then you are safe. I can get many decisions, but I will not get disciples who continue the race. And we have done a big mistake that we have lower the standard so now it's so easy to get saved it's almost like it's so cheap salvation is so cheap it costs you nothing what? it costs God everything it costs God his son and we say it's so easy now and costs nothing no it will cost you everything the one who holds on to his life is going to lose it but the one who laid down his life for my sake is going to win it. If anyone wants to follow, be my disciple, he needs to deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is how much it costs to follow Christ. It costs everything. So instead of having the idea when you share the gospel to people, instead of thinking, oh, I just need to make that person make the right decision now, and then it don't matter what happens afterwards. You can keep on doing that. And then you get many decisions, and one day we woke up and see how wrong we was. Because we got many decisions, but no, none of them entered into the promised land. Instead, we should preach radical, we should preach clear, we should preach about not only about salvation, but about following Christ. Okay? I'll just pray. God, we thank you for what you're doing. I pray for this word that you will come and help us and set us free in our mindset when it comes to salvation. Help us to understand, Jesus, that it's, it's about you. It's about obeying you. It's about believing in you. It's about following you. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God who came to save us from our sins. You came to remove sin for us. You died on that cross to set us free, to create a new man in us, that we, Jesus, through repentance, we experience a new heart. Through the baptism water, we'll experience a freedom from the old life, a freedom from sin. 
And through the Holy Spirit, we will learn to walk the new life. Not led, not by the flesh like before, but walk a new life by the Spirit. And when we continue in you, Jesus, continue in faith, continue in obedience, one day we are going to enter into your kingdom. We are going to experience the eternal life. Help us to continue, Jesus. Help us to not be deceived. Help us to not walk the broad road, but help us to walk the narrow road through the narrow gate. And we want to be one of those few who find it. We want to be one of those who keep in faith. So come with your Holy Spirit and help us to understand the gospel, to understand the word, and to lift the freedom you have for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.